gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name. Well, good morning and welcome to our online service. We're glad you've chosen to join us for worship this morning. If you're new with us, we'd love for you to check out our website to find out more about us at calvarymp.org. Or if you're with our church and you just want to know some of the updates that have been going on, you can be checking your emails. Uh, there we go, have emails that go out on Tuesdays and Fridays. You can be checking out our website, calvarymp.org. Uh, slash COVID. Um, but we also want to let you know of something that's going on this Wednesday. We're showing local love to our Henry County Health Center staff. And on Wednesday, they're going to get a free coffee of their choice at Coffee Depot here in town. If you'd like to donate to that and show your appreciation for our, our health providers, um, health care providers, then we'd love for you to, you can give either by bringing in money here to the church, or you can give by designating that at our online giving on our website, um, and just designate it as local love um, for coffee uh, here in town. So we encourage you to be a part of that uh, and to be giving and encouraging uh, our healthcare staff here in town. Um, but also just there's many others that we can show love to that we're hoping to in the future. Um, but this is a great way to start and we'd love for you to participate with us. Also want to uh, encourage you to be praying uh, for our staff and deacons as well as we begin discussions on how to transition back into having services together. So we want to do this in the, the best way possible that will show the greatest amount of love to one another. That will be a safe place for us to come and worship, um, but also that will glorify God in, in how we come back together to begin worshiping. So we're starting to think about that right now. Be praying for us as there are many decisions that have to go into that. But right now we're here to worship. We're here to sing praises to our Lord, even from our own living rooms. And we're here to hear a message from the word that will encourage us and that will challenge us. So let's go ahead and pray. Lord, thank you for Christ. Christ's death on the cross, his burial, and his resurrection. Lord, I pray that each Sunday we'll remember the resurrection and celebrate that together as we gather. I pray that you will uh, allow this service to be edifying not only to our hearts, um, but that it'll challenge us to move out and show, showing how we can serve one another in love, but also it'll glorify you. And so we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me in reading from Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Please join us in continuing singing with a new song based on this psalm, Psalm 91. Christ will be
angels gather to protect me when they hear my Savior call. Sovereign hands are ever ready to uphold me should I fall. Save me Christ will be my hideaway. In you, my God, I trust. You are strong and here with us. In you, my hope remains. Christ will be my hideaway. to share with you a few more of the words from Psalm 91, verse 5 and 6. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. And on down in 9 and 10. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No place come near your tent. And we understand we live in a broken, fallen world and there are evils. There, there is a plague and a pestilence that is very real. There are other evils and disasters that are happening or threatening. Economic disaster, political tensions, local, global, all of these things. Uh, and, and in God's sovereign plan, those things may happen to us. It's not wrong that we pray that they don't. And I encourage you to pray during this time that, that plague and pestilence would not befall us, those that we know, those that we love, uh, and many other people that we don't know. Uh, but even if they do, uh, we trust God will bring good out of evil, uh, and that for those of us who know him, uh, that we have the good in Jesus Christ uh, that, that we need, and all other evils pale in comparison to that. So let's join in praying together at this time.
John 8, 32. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Romans 8, 2. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me, there my burdened soul found liberty. my sin I learned then I trembled at the law I spurned till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary mercy there was great and grace was free pardon there was multiplied to me there my burdened soul found liberty at plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty.
It's hard to believe this is our fifth Sunday of online services. And when we go through something along this line, it can be straining on our relationships. A particular resource that I appreciate is that which is put out by Ken Sandy called The Peacemaker. I've been using this for about 20 years now as I work through issues in my own life and as I help others as a Christian conciliator. Uh, As the author of The Peacemaker, he had worked with uh, a lot of people who are going through conflict for decades, and he decided that he wanted to get upstream from conflict by creating a course called Relational Wisdom 360. That course allows us to be able to work on six specific skills that can improve our emotional interactions with other people. And so we want to uh, take some time to consider the value of that type of course. And he has been giving free scholarships for those who would like to take his course online. It covers eight sessions to, to develop these six skills, and the information is available on the slide. And I trust that you'll take advantage of this time for the eight sessions. You can work at your own pace. You can even work together in groups. Uh, And it's a $49 value available because of the COVID-19 crisis to be able to help people who are going through some difficult times in their relationships. We are going to be looking at relationships from three different uh, angles. Uh, For example, in Psalm 139, we looked at the fact of the relationship with God. And then last week, as we covered the interaction of the, uh, the week of, of emotional experiences that Peter had through the Passion Week, was dealing with self. And now over the next couple of weeks, we would like to be able to cover those relationships with others. And as we consider the element of others, the two things that we do is to engage with others uh, by serving them, and the other is being aware of what their needs are by having compassion for them. These can be summarized in one word, serve. Back when I was in college several years ago, I was in a homiletics class, and I was assigned a passage to be able to preach. And it was just one verse, and it comes out of Galatians 5, 13, and it says this, For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So today, what we're going to be looking at is how do we serve in this crisis, that we might be able to look at five different key words that will spell out the word serve, and they come from the training that Ken Sandy offers called Relational Wisdom. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege of our time together. I thank you for our friends that are, are willing to take time today and to uh, listen to your word and to put it into practice. Father, as we think of the challenges that we have in our relationships that are around us, that maybe after all this time of things being uncertain and things changing and, and, and not knowing exactly how things are going to turn out, that our relationship with you might be strained or even within ourselves as we start having self-doubt or, or even self-loathe because of, uh, of certain issues that are going on in our lives. Father, I pray that you'll help us to get those relationships right uh, through the work of your word. And Lord, as we consider the fact that this type of a crisis tends to cause us to draw in towards ourself, help us to think about how we can indeed serve others. And we pray that you will use me as your uh, instrument today to serve the folks that are listening today. In Jesus' name, amen. As I mentioned, there are five points to this serve, and they they are an acrostic, and we'll talk about the first one now, because it entails the important word, smile. Now, I know smiling isn't always everybody's deal, but you know you think about it, during this time when we're doing all the social distancing, probably the smile is the closest we can get to somebody. And it's very tempting to get to where we close ourselves off to other individuals and do not communicate in any fashion. But I think that God would have us to want to smile to others. The scripture says this, A glad heart makes a cheerful face, 
And it's true, when we have a cheerful face, people assume there's something going on on the inside. And so that we can get to a place where we're not as approachable if we're not willing to smile or do something that gives that person that impression. Now, smiling, by the way, is even important if you might be on the phone. Uh, I was a telemarketer, believe it or not, for some time after I graduated from Bible college. And my responsibility was to call people all around the nation and to offer them an opportunity to purchase something that I was selling. Now, I got to admit, I hated the job, and it was my least favorite thing to do, is to pick up a phone and call a stranger. But I was given instructions before I called was to smile before I even dialed the number. And then once I got on there, that I tried to maintain that smile as I communicated. They told me that even from having the smile on the outside, that that somehow resonated in my voice, or at least in my attitude, and maybe the tone in which I might use. And so I made that a practice regularly, and still use it today, is that when I'm calling, I will uh, smile and, and then punch in the m- number and then uh, uh, proceed with my conversation. I have found that it has helped me to be able to have a good attitude as I'm in the conversation. Another thing to consider is that there are times when we're interacting, whether it's those people that uh, uh, we might be seeing at a store or even those that we might be social distancing with or we working because we're an essential uh, worker and we see these people, folks uh, on a regular basis and we might find ourselves with a resting face that it isn't as approachable. Years ago, when my wife and I were first dating, she mentioned the fact that I had a no face, and it would come on at different times. And I would look at her when she said it, I said, what? He says, that's it right there. And so you kind of freeze your face and go and look in the mirror to get an idea of what that no face looks like. And I asked her, why do you call the no face? And she said, well, because basically you look unapproachable. It looks like if anyone was going to come to you and ask you a question, the answer would be no. Now, each of us have a different way in which when we're not thinking about anything, our faces might uh, land and, uh, and is a resting face. It would be good to maybe consider what other people think we're thinking about during those particular times. Because there is a tendency for us to assume when someone responds to us a certain way that it's our fault and it's not something else going on in their lives. Uh, some other ways that... Uh, you might think about is what other way might I be seeming unapproachable? Maybe being distancing myself from others, not in the social distancing fashion, but it's just in the way of my demeanor, way I use my nonverbals, or even some of the word choices that I use that tend to distance me from other people. But basically it says, I'm not approachable. If you're genuinely wanting to serve other people, especially in a time of crisis like this, you need to think intentionally how you're going to present yourself even though you may not even be talking to them because it does open the door for us to to be able to encourage them to understand what their needs are and ultimately be able to serve them. So being polite is an important thing as we work through this situation. There are folks that are out there that are part of the essential staff and they're doing things and they're working hard and they have a lot of stress upon them and it would do us good to, in a sense, smile at them or at least be polite to them so they can be encouraged. So the first part of serving someone is to be approachable and for the most part, that's, uh, that's just like smiling and being inviting in that relationship. The second letter in serve is that of explore and empathize. The Bible says the purpose in a man's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. We should be curious about other people, not for the purpose of exploiting them or avoiding them, but so that we can better serve and love them. And the scriptures there are saying that we can be intentional in our interactions with other people to where they trust us and are willing to share things that we then can be able to help them concerning. 
So we can consider how to do this a lot when uh, you might be on a phone or in a video or in written fashion of trying to think of ways in which you might be able to encourage another person to be able to share some things that are going in their life. One tool that we have to help others feel that they have an invitation to talk about their situation is to ask questions. Now, a key to this is that questions ought to be ones that are designed to invite a person in and help them to see that you truly want to understand them, not questions that are designed to interrogate them or to paint them into a corner. Uh, if you believe this, then this, and then this, and then this, and, and feeling like they're being uh, attacked by an attorney or something along that line. No, exploring questions are designed to truly convey to the person that you care, that you really want to know them who they, for who they are. And quite frankly, at this time when some of our communication is somewhat limited and maybe in some cases we have a little more time on our hands in these type of situations, this could be a good time to listen to someone and to better understand what's going on in their lives. Sometimes we might be dealing with someone where their life has been turned completely upside down because of this COVID-19 crisis. And we might be the individual that God is using to help them understand that someone genuinely cares. So exploring and empathizing. Uh, the concept of empathizing uh, is kind of wrapped up by Peter this way. He says this in 1 Peter 3.8. He says, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. As we consider someone's situation, that we, we think about what they're going through, and that we, we consider what, what that might be like. Last week, when we, a couple of weeks ago, when we went through the, the process of looking at Peter during that Passion Week, that's a form of sympathy, as that you're looking and seeing how did all those difficult situations impact him as a person. And we can do the same thing with other people as we listen to their story and we, we go to understand what is going on in their lives. And we can also, as it uses that word brotherly love, is kind of finding those common ground that we might have. Uh, that, that, uh, that we see that we not only have this love of sacrificing for someone else, but we might find we have more things in common if we listen and explore to understand what's going on in their life. And also, he says, using that word of a humble mind. That it's not so much that we are listening to this information so that we can uh, one-up them. Our goal is to genuinely understand them and to love them and to explore what's going on in their life and to be able to empathize with them. Now, it's interesting. We get caught up in just understanding a person and not really know what to do with that. But the item that God wants us to do is he wants us to do this third item. First you're smiling, uh, then you're exploring and empathizing. But the third item is where you're genuinely having an impact in their life because you are reconciling, helping them reconcile. First, to God. The Bible says there, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. One of our jobs is to help people be reconciled to God. That when they come to us and maybe they're sharing some things that are difficult for them, they might be experiencing fear, maybe anger, bitterness, envy. Maybe they're frustrated with the slothfulness that they feel because of their changed lifestyle at the point. And they don't know how to reconcile this in their life. And they're very discouraged and they're very upset. And our opportunity there is to not just listen to them and say, wow, your life is rough, but to be able to reconcile them to God, help them to be able to uh, have a better understanding of how God sees them and how that God values them and how that God wants to, to work in their life and what God has done for them. And we can lead them to Jesus Christ and allow them to have a relationship with him and that they can too talk about how that Christ changed their lives. 
There might be times, too, where there are individuals who are believers. They're children of God. But they've gotten to a place where these type of items of anger and fear and bitterness and envy and sloth and other aspects of their life have, have kind of draw, drew them down. And they're, they're discouraged. And, and we can be instrumental in helping them learn to put off certain behaviors and, and to put on behaviors that are pleasing to Christ as one who would be a child of God walking with him and helping them to renew their mind. And so we do have some great opportunities to help people reconcile to God. But also this, we can help people reconcile to others. It says this, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. God genuinely wants us to be unified. And those of us who are believers, sometimes we get a little disunified or in conflict or in in distraction with each other and and uh, we we deal with a lot of of conflict that could be coming through those relationships and God wants us to be instruments in the lives of others to be peacemakers to help them work through things and we should be interested in helping people make it right we shouldn't just listen to somebody's concerns and complaints about somebody and, and just uh, sympathize with them. We should be desiring to help them bridge into the life of that person. Because quite frankly, if we're not a part of the problem and we're not a part of the solution, we really shouldn't be part of the story. And so we should be thinking about how can I be part of the solution? And one of those ways is I can be a peacemaker and I can help them work through the issues that they might have with another person. I can help them reconcile. There's an example of that in Scripture. In Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is writing to them and encouraging them that there's two women, Eudia and Syntyche, that they're not of the same mind and they're struggling in their relationship with each other. He doesn't give a whole lot of details as to what it is, but he does encourage them this way. He says, help these women, and I put in parentheses, to agree in the Lord who have labored side by side with me in the gospel. Paul is exhorting the people of Philippi, the leaders there, to come in and be peacemakers and to help them work through those type of situations. So God has called us not only to serve people by smiling and being approachable, not only by exploring and being empathetic as to what's going on in their life, but also to help them be reconciled first to God and then to other people. The fourth item that we look at is the important word, value. The Bible says, in humility, count others more significant than yourselves, Philippians 2.3, where we are to consider people to be important in our lives. And people enjoy knowing that. People enjoy the fact that they might be important in our lives or to a particular situation. But we can get so caught up in our own lives and the things that we need and we desire and we need to get done that we may not convey that to the person as to how important they are in our lives. Paul gave an example right after that in the same chapter of Philippians. uh, And he says this, but you know Timothy's proven worth. There before the people of Philippi, he is, in a sense, showing and displaying how much value Timothy is, not only to him, but also to them. And he does this also about uh, uh, Phoebe when he's writing to the Romans. And also he talks about Onesiphorus, who is one who oft refreshed him. And Paul was regularly lifting up other individuals and showing the value that they have. And so the importance is for us to be able to convey to other people that really they're important. Now, this doesn't mean that we just have to use flattery or anything along that line. It should be that we are actually looking for things that we see of value in other people. Sometimes our default is to see the things other people do that disappoint us. But I believe God wants us to look for those things to help us see the good things in the other person that we can encourage. Even in conflict, Jesus said that this way. When he says, if you have a problem with someone or someone sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And he says, if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. 
Even in that context, Jesus is saying our goal ought to be to affirm a relationship, not to win an argument, not to get what we want, not to just get something off our chest, but to genuinely be able to win that relationship. Why? Because that relationship is important to us. And we need to be in the habit of being able to convey that value. Here's just four areas that I think of that can be helpful for us when we think about valuing someone. Some people are very honored and they feel valued when we spend time with them. When we're willing to uh, invest that time so that we're with them and sometimes we don't even have to accomplish anything but we're spending time with them. That means a lot to them. It means that, that they are important to you. Another area might be the words. Paul used that often, as I've mentioned before, and, and encouraging other people and lifting them up and talking about how important they are. And we can get in the habit of that as well, of valuing people by thanking them for what they've done or talking about how well they did in a particular area on something. Again, you don't have to come up with flattering words. That's of no use. But when you can come up with something that genuinely encourages and edifies them, those are the type of words God wants us to use. And then thirdly, just being able to assist people. Some people are very valued when they know someone is willing to take their, take their energies or resources and help them get a project done or help them do something. That means a lot to them. Another way that people are valued is to know that you're willing to invest in them. They appreciate the fact that you give them a gift or that you uh, spend money to be able to help them accomplish something because that means that they're important to you. And so we, there's a variety of ways in which we can show value. The key is not everyone sees that they're being valued in the same way. And so we may have to be a little more creative and more observant, uh, doing more exploring to find out what are the ways in which this person really genuinely feels valued. The final letter of serve is to encourage A very common word that is used in many places in the New Testament and the importance of us exhorting or encouraging one another. But the place that's probably most common and maybe even seeming most frustrating for us right now is that is found in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. He says, not neglecting to meet together. Wow, are we neglecting to meet together? Uh, I'm standing and preaching in front of an auditorium that's not full of people. Uh, And the reason we're not meeting together is not because we don't want to, it's because right now we can't. But the Bible goes on to say, is the habit of some, as is the habit of some, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, what's interesting here is that the purpose of meeting together is to encourage one another. So that should give us an idea that we should be making it our goal not just to meet with each other, but to encourage one another. And there are so many venues in which we can do that. As I mentioned, we can use phone calls to encourage, emails, maybe in a postcard, working on a project to help someone, providing gifts for someone, uh, thank you notes, and, or just even words of thanks to, to help encourage them. And to just recognize that sharing words of scripture or praying for someone is a way to encourage them. We want to be able to serve others, and sometimes that serving is to be able to share with them the truth of God and be able to speak the word into their life. But may I suggest this? I learned this a long time ago when I was in my early 20s. I was told that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that's why the whole process of serve is so important, that we're smiling, exploring, and empathizing reconciling, valuing, and encouraging one another. And one way you can do that is be a part of some of the extra activities that we have going on. We have attempted to use Zoom to help people stay connected and to be able to get together. Now, you may be thinking, well, I don't need that, but have you thought about what other people might need? That maybe your presence in one of those Zoom sessions might be a source of encouragement to other people. I want to challenge us to think about the importance of encouraging 
so that when we do get back together again, when we're able to fill this auditorium with people, that our goal isn't just to be able to walk through the door and say, I'm home. I'm finally able to do what I used to be able to do, but that I can come in through these doors and be able to say, now I have an opportunity to encourage people in ways that I haven't been able to before, and I want to make this a refreshing experience for those I come in contact with. Wouldn't that be a wonderful byproduct from this time when we have to be away from each other? That when we see each other, our goal is to be a refreshing encouragement. Well, I want to encourage you to smile and to explore and empathize and to be a part of God's reconciliation plan in the lives of people to show value to them and encourage them. Would you be willing to serve others during this crisis Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to serve you. You have given us freedom. You have allowed us to be able to be free from the bondage of sin. Father, may we not waste that on ourselves. Help us to be willing to reach out to others. Lord, it is scary what we've been going through. And it's so tempting to want to just draw in and to try to avoid reaching out to others. But yet, Lord, we know there are ways which we can use good sense in regard to social distancing, but still show that we care, still show that we want to serve other people. Father, I ask that you would give us intentionality, wisdom, and opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. The greatest thing in all my life is knowing you. The greatest thing in all my life is knowing you. I want to know. to speak as you would speak.